So thanks so much for uh, for having me. I'll say, uh, I want to say, uh, before I start, I want to say thanks to Leonie and Leanne and Nathan for having me on the panel with them. I'm, uh, I'm flattered to be on a panel with folks I admire so much, so thanks a lot. And thanks, uh, thanks to Penn and uh, UBC for inviting me. And um, uh, maybe more than that, I want to say and acknowledge that when we're talking about Vancouver, we're talking about the unceded and occupied territory of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh folks. And I want to say thanks so much for the generosity in hosting us here. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit today about uh, about the present and the future of Vancouver in the, con in the context of gentrification and displacement. And those are terms that are used kind of ubiquitously and profligately um, in so many different ways and for so many different reasons. And I just want to try to add just a tiny little thing here today. Um, and in much of my work and much of my, the circles I roll in, um, there's kind of a constant <coughs> backbeat drone of conversation about gentrification. And if you live in East Vancouver and you still rent and hang out in lefty circles, it's whatever is more than constant. Um, and the definitional constraints and the, and the causes and the effects of gentrification are, are, are pretty fuzzy in lots of respects and certainly contested. And, and in many of the conversations I have, there's actually very little shared agreement about what that actually means, um, about what displacement means. But I have noticed, um, and I've noticed this among my colleagues and myself certainly, is that when we're talking about gentrification and displacement, we're often talking in fact, actually, we're all, almost always talking about somebody else. Um, it's always somebody else, somebody who has a little bit more privilege than we do, who we're talking about, uh, who is doing that, doing that displacement. Um, and I think it's, it's absolutely and certainly the case that in a, in a dynamic city region like Vancouver, um, certain people are going to be constantly getting pushed out, pushed around. Um, pushed in certain directions. Um, and that leads to a certain amount of contestation about who qualifies as authentic residents. Who are the, um, who are the folks that have authentic claim to particular, place, you know, particular pieces of land? And I hear that in my neighborhood. I live uh, just off the drive for the last 25 years. And I hear people say, I hear settler people say, you know, I'm not going to be able to, you know, to live any longer in my neighborhood. And I, and I wonder what that means exactly. I wonder, I wonder, what do you mean by my land? What do you mean by my territory? Who actually has a legitimate claim to particular pieces of property? Um, and on what basis might we claim displacement? Um, and so I've been interested. I've been poking around these questions for a long time. And I was, I, the other day I was in, I had a, a group of, uh, MA students uh, in Portland, um, and we were we were visiting. Uh, we go we do trips to Portland. I, I run trips to Portland and then Seattle in alternate years. And so we took a, a pack of urban studies students uh, down to Portland. And those of you that know that city will know that the the northeast of of Portland uh, was once uh, a thriving and historically African American community uh, that has largely now been dispersed. Um, and so we spent some time. Uh, uh, some time ago, uh, doing some research and, and, uh, and meeting with some people up in the Northeast. And we sat, I mean, Portland had a, a fairly small black population, uh, but it's now scattered uh, all through the kind of suburban and Washington and far eastern regions of, of Portland. And so we were doing this, we were doing this workshop uh, with this guy called John Washington, who was one of the, the co-presidents of the uh, Northeast Business Association. And he said, you know, the moment that I knew black people were screwed in Portland, the moment I saw the bike lanes come in. And you could see a whole bunch of our students kind of stiffen. Um, <laughs> and then, and then the Joyce Nelson is a, a friend of mine and a co-president of the business association. She says, yep, and I knew black people were fucked as soon as the community gardens came right after that. <laughs> and you could see, you know, and I you could feel myself going, uh-huh. And you could looked around and see a lot of our students, super great, excellent students, uh, you know, Blanche. How, how could a bike lane be a bad thing? What, what are you, what, what? What are you talking about? Um, how, how, what, what could be possibly wrong with the community garden? Like that's as, you know, as, as, as benign and friendly as it gets. 
And so in that spirit, I want to talk just for a second about, if you can forgive me for a second, just I want to talk about myself. Um, I, I, spent, I spent a long time. Um, seasoned warrior felt a bit much, but <laughs> I spent a long time. I spent 25 years living in East Vancouver, my whole adult life. Um, and I, that whole time, for 25 years, I've been engaged in activist community work and organizing in a very, very small stretch of territory. Um, I've always rented. I've rented the same house for the last 16 years. Um, my house is full of kids, uh, some of mine, uh, lots of whom aren't. Um, uh, I run, I started and run a whole series of community projects, um, alternative schools, community schools, the Purple Thistle Youth Center. I run a native settler exchange program. I started this program called Groundswell. I started Car Free Vancouver Day. Forgive me for my immodesty, a few other things. And I'm, I'm kind of proud of, of some of those projects, and almost all the ones that I list and a few others are still going, and I, and I like to think have made a certain amount of impact in East Vancouver. Um, and I've tried really hard to think and to organize in the neighborhoods that I love. But over the course of those 25 years, uh, East Vancouver has become relentlessly um, more expensive. Uh, and people uh, have become consistently and fairly relentlessly <laughs> displaced in the neighborhoods that I love. And I mean that in the empirical sense, and I mean that in the vernacular sense as well. And I mean that in the very specific sense of seeing my friends, my close neighbors, my family members, some of my daughters, not able to live in neighborhoods where they grew up, having to be forced further and further to margins. Um, and the pressure that all of us feel in East Vancouver from housing costs across the kind of housing spectrum is, is significant and I think seeps into almost every aspect of our lives. Um, and I think I should be, if I were to be honest, which I am periodically, um, I, I think I bear a, a fairly significant load of responsibility for that. Um, I, I like to think that many of the projects that I've run and started and continue to run in my activist and community organizing work have done something to make my neighborhoods a very small two mile stretch that I've really s spent my life in from commercial drive to the downtown east side, uh, a very small stretch. Um, I think I've done something to add to those places, to, to make them funner, to make them funkier, to make them more equitable, to make them more welcoming. Um, and relentlessly, given the logics of late capitalism, those activities have contributed significantly to making the neighborhoods more attractive and thus more eligible and much more open to predatory capitalism. Um, I think that is undeniable. And it might be that my activities have, been, have had inadvertent side effects, unintended consequences, or maybe not. And so, and, and I, I find myself now at 45 years old looking back and wondering about a legacy of my activities in neighborhoods and communities with neighbors that I love that it may in fact have been fundamentally destructive. And I think if I were to be honest, I legitimately have played a significant and perhaps pervasive role in forcing my friends, family, and neighborhoods, neighbors out of the homes uh, and out of the neighborhoods which they've lived in for a long time. And that's not necessarily the best feeling in the world. Um, and it's a story that's told in low-income neighborhoods, and it's a classic story of gentrification and displacement and dispossession that have, that's happened for generations and generations. It's a cliche story of low-income neighborhoods um, whereby you know, low-income, community-minded, civically minded artists, activists move in, beatify it, gentrify it, make it more interesting, and then are forced out by people who can afford the newly attractiveness of those neighborhoods. So I think back to that and I think, well, what should I have been done then? What should I have been doing? Maybe it would have been a whole lot, if I were really interested in, in these neighbors, if I were really interested in, 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 in my friends in this community, maybe the better thing would have been to start them you know, doing some drive-bys. Maybe I should have been chucking garbage around. Maybe I should have been, you know, I should have been leaving those low-income kids that I've worked with for 25 years alone. Maybe I should have done everything I could to make the neighborhood less attractive. Then at least a whole bunch of us could have stayed. So, and then that leads me then, of course, to particular junctures. And well, what the hell am I supposed to do? That sounds stupid. Am I supposed to make my neighborhood less attractive? Am I supposed to make my neighborhood less cool to be in? What am I, how am I supposed to behave? How are everyday people supposed to behave? And in the context of a planning school, then how can planners behave? In the absence of significant shifts in global capitalism, given the you know, realities of what we live in, and given what my friend 
Bob, as he would have said last night, probably would say to me, he said, I didn't make the goddamn motion, I just swim in it. Well, how am I supposed to swim then? What am I supposed to, how are we supposed to move? And how can we think and how can we act and how can we act collectively together? So I got a couple of just short points, just that uh, as I've been trying to piece these ideas together and to think about how to move. And one of the things is that I know that many of the core folks, core decision-making folks that I've talked about, talked with in my research over the years and who are responsible in many ways for Vancouver's successes, and those are many and those are significant and shouldn't be derided, but have a tendency to act as if Vancouver's descent into the second least affordable housing market in the world was just an ancillary issue. It just happened by accident. And in fact, one planner told me it was just something we didn't think about. One very senior planner told me that. Another planner that I met with who's had a very significant role in Vancouver the last 20 years said, well, look, it's a beautiful place and we've done so well, so of course it's going to be expensive. That's just the way it works. And the, the, the language speaks as if equity issues, of issues of affordability, as if, as, as if issues of poverty and low-income residents were somehow beyond the control of decision makers, that it was just something that just happened and we couldn't do much about it. And I would just suggest to you that, that tonight in, across the globe, there's a billion people, approximately, they are going to go to sleep hungry tonight. And they're not going to sleep hungry tonight because there's not enough food in the world. People estimate that there's more than, you know, there's 1.5 times as much food as we need to feed every person in the world, but still there's a billion people going to sleep hungry tonight. There are people that are going homeless, houseless, and underhoused in Vancouver, not because there isn't enough money and resources to build homes. Those are actual political decisions. Decisions that have been made to spend money, to spend resources on other things. $500 million stadium roofs, convention centers, et cetera. But that's not just a particular set of decisions. Those are ongoing sets of decisions. And to constantly defer slash genuflect to the market, whatever that might mean, is a very particular and very substantive political choice. Secondly, point that I'd like to add to this, and, and this is just really kind of echoing a lot of really good work my pal and colleague Glenn Coltart has kind of worked through brilliantly. He says that in lots of senses, and this is I think true, it makes sense to view uh, narratives of gentrification and displacement through a lens of colonialism, that the urban frontier becomes just one other uh, level of dispossession. And I think that's right to point to gentrification as, as, a, as, as colonization. I think we risk then thinking about anti-gentrification efforts um, in a decontextualized and very fuzzy kind, kind sort of set of claims about the commons that tends to inadvertently treat settler colonial cities um, as urban alias, as space void of indigenous sovereignty, spaces void of previous occupation uh, by margin now marginalized and low-income residents. And finally, and these are a third interconnected point that I'll cut short here a little bit, is that I think phrases and conversations around density, which I'm interested and in, mostly sympathetic to, oftentimes are framed in rather uh, vapid ways, as if density itself were ameliorative of dispossession and displacement. And I'll submit to you that we need a, a, an ongoing and much more rigorous interrogation of what we mean when we talk about development. That far too often, I think that we default, and it seeps into our language in all kinds of unexpected ways, um, a rationalist, modernist, and, and ultimately colonialist stance about development. That obviously everybody needs development. Who wouldn't want that? Um, and that I think that, that's a, that a stance that defaults to development is ultimately about arrogance, improvement, and narratives of progress that I think we need to challenge. Um, not, again, I think not in others, not in those people who are doing development, but I think in, in ourselves. Um, and I would just say that, that those are particular lines, and they're not super well articulated in, in 10 minutes, but probably even if I had 40 minutes, I wouldn't be able to articulate them exactly clearly because I'm, I'm grappling with, with, with urban trajectories intellectually, and I'm trying to think much of this through theoretically and through kind of some concentrated research, but that's really kind of an ancillary thing. Really what I'm trying to do for myself is, it, is in an everyday kind of quotidian, kind of frankly speaking, emotional way, um, is trying to think about what do I do? How do I act? And, and, I, and I think I'll, I'll extrapolate that to, 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 the, to some kind of we. How do, how do people with good intentions, how do we resist displacement and gentrification? Uh, and how do we resist narratives that apparently make them appear to be inevitable? And I would suggest to you that 
the narratives by which we often default to, narratives of development, uh, are not just borrow and build on, but explicitly reference the colonial infrastructures and the colonial mentalities by which Vancouver itself was founded. Um, and I think that the question is that for me is about how to act, how to behave, and how to think in a swiftly changing city that it's evolving. How can we embrace difference? How can we embrace the influx of others, um, which, I, which I think is, we, is perhaps one of the very best things about the city, to how to, how to embrace a fluid city, a, flu a city that is, is constantly liquid and constantly changing, that doesn't then involve, by necessity, displacement and marginalization of low-income populations that tend to get forced further and further to the periphery where their economic and social marginalization is augmented by physical isolation. And, and how can we do that without deliberately or inadvertently replicating colonial relationships? Um, and I would say that in the end, maybe not in the end, in the end, well, the end of right now, but for me, I, I, I place a lot of faith in, in words like hospitality and, and generosity and friendship. Those are words that I return to as kind of ideals for to try to think about how to act and move um, in my thinking. And, and, and I, I think if I were to be Frank, I, uh, a review of much of my activity, as proud as I am of some of it over the last 25 years and much of my activist work, I, I'm, I'm very far from convinced that I have consistently le lived up to those ideals. Um, and I think that the question that I would like to ask going forward is, is how can I, and perhaps we, do right by, by our neighbors? Thanks so much, folks. <laughs>